text appears over black. Cotton. A group of Union soldiers posed together in an archival photo. As a teenager, history was about dates and dead people. I would prefer to talk about boys and athletes. An old photo shows enslaved African Americans picking cotton in a sprawling field. Black history was even more depressing. Slaves and cotton. I was glad to see that that part of history was limited to one or two pages in public school history books. Enslaved men, women, and children gather around a mule-drawn cart. Another photo shows a close-up of a bale of cotton. While visiting Lowell National Historical Park in Lowell, Massachusetts, I discovered a bale of cotton. The bale sits on display at the National Historical Park. This is where all that cotton went to. I reached out and touched it, as many thousands before me. I learned so much at Lowell. Southern cotton, northern textile mills, and the economic relationship circle was complete. The north was dependent on southern cotton. Cotton was king, the cash cow in America, the world's largest exporter of cotton. Even the currency of that time period exploited slaves and cotton. A Confederate $100 bill features an image of enslaved men hoeing in a field. Other bills depict similar images. Blacks were featured on some of the earliest currency in America. Northern mills also made Negro cloth or burlap. You know, the cloth that was coarse, scratchy, constricting, and inferior. Over a swath of burlap, a photo shows two young African-American men in tattered clothes. This type of cloth was sold back to southern plantations. An illustration depicts a cotton mill, and a broadside advertisement reads, 75 young women from 15 to 35 years of age wanted to work in the cotton mills in Lowell and Chicopee, Massachusetts. The demand was so great that New England newspapers regularly recruited for cotton mill girls. An archival image shows a young woman wearing a smock as she stands at her machine in a mill. I never knew how slavery affected the North and how this would change my understanding of that peculiar institution, right down to the clothes that I was wearing. Illustrations from Harper's Weekly show a man labeled King Cotton stomping on a slave in 1861, Columbia working at a cotton spinning machine in 1882, and Mills spewing smoke as enslaved African Americans work in a cotton field, now a green cotton field. In 2007, while researching my family's history, I found out that my great-great-great-grandmother was Abby Jackson. Abby was born around 1840 in Maury County, Tennessee. After the Civil War, she eventually ends up in southwest Georgia near Jakin. We went on a tour of Jakin and stopped at the river site where Abby and her kids were taken off of a ferry or flatboat and sent to work on a cotton plantation. In 1911, Abby purchased 31 acres of that land for $100. A historic deed from Early County, Georgia, appears over an image of a ripe brown cotton field. We Jacksons are still on that land, but now the land is being leased out and the cotton is harvested with large John Deere tractors. An image reads, Jackson Family Reunion, Preserving Our Past for Future Generations, July 2008. I have decorated folk art and cotton stalks in my house. My family and friends ask, why? I tell them about Abby Jackson. From a cotton picker to a cotton producer. A photo shows three older Jackson family descendants. Abby would be so proud of her descendants. And I'm proud to call her G-Mom.
More Jackson family photos show a woman in a white dress as a man puts his arm around her and a child holding a doll as she poses with other little girls. Hands cup a small branch of fluffy white cotton. Text by Sherry Jackson. Image credits, Major General G.O.G. G. Meade and Staff, 1863 Library of Congress. Picking Cotton, Savannah, Georgia, Early Negro Life, Lonnie and Goebel Photographers, 1867 through 1890. More image credits appear. Music, I Got a Long White Robe Over in Zion. Deacon Sam Jackson and the Oak Grove Missionary Baptist Church Choir, collected by Willis James, Fort Valley, Georgia, June through July, 1943. Library of Congress. Logos, National Park Service and National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. This story was produced in a workshop facilitated by Story Center. Listen deeply, tell stories. StoryCenter.org.